What a wonderful time to be able to come together and to praise our Lord, and to worship Him, and to study in His Word about how it is an everyday event for us, not just on Sundays, for us to be able to glorify and magnify His name. That is done certainly in our own private time, our time in the Word, but it should also be done in the first institution that God established, which is not the church. The first institution that God established is the home. And we should uh, reflect the image of Christ in our home. And uh, we're going to talk about uh, how that all began. So if you will, take your Bible this morning and turn to the book of Genesis. We're walking through the book of Genesis um, and we're in chapter 2 right now. Last week we talked about how uh, the uh, chapters and verses were divided later on, uh, as late as 1205. Um, and really the last part of uh, chapter 1, as it's divided there, uh, chapter 2, verses 1, 2, and 3 really complete the thought of chapter 1. It ought to go with chapter 1, and, and it completes the story of creation. There's not a conflict in the scripture. There's not a contradiction in the scripture when you get into chapter 2 because in ancient writings often they would uh, write in a way that would tell the story in a chronological order and then they would come back and retell the story but it would not be in the order. It would be focused on something. It would talk about the apex of, of the story and that's what happens here is that we get into chapter 2 and, he's, and, and Moses is writing by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the apex of the creation was man. And so we're going to look at, at, a, at the event that God brought Eve into the picture and that he prepared and he gave her to Adam. So we're going to begin reading verse, 12, uh, verse 18. Genesis chapter 2 and uh, verse 18. Excuse me. Y'all go ahead and read ahead. <laughs> Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18. Then the Lord God said, It's not good for the man to be alone, and I will make him a helper suitable for him. And out of the ground the Lord formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was its name. That would have been a fun event to witness, wouldn't it? The man gave names to all the cattle and to the birds of the sky and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper suitable for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. And then he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at the place. The Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and the flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Springtime is a wonderful time for weddings. We've got several of our young uh, couples that are getting married, and uh, they're here, yay. Uh, they're excited about the wedding, or at least the brides are. And... Uh, it is a fun, fun experience. But whenever you come to that ceremony, whenever you're standing there at the altar and that you are sharing the experience of joining together as husband and wife, what you're actually doing is reenacting what we read in the, script, in the scripture. God performed the first marriage. The first nuptial words that were ever spoken were these words as God brought them together. And it is a blessing. It is a good thing. Matter of fact, Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 22 says, He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor with the Lord. As we, as we look at this um, wonderful experience, chapter 2 has a purpose as it focuses on Adam and its purpose. We talked about it last week. 
uh, God placed him in an ideal, he was first of all the ideal person. God made him and, and he was perfect. He was formed as God intended and God formed him to be able to relate to the world. He formed him out of the, the dust. He breathed in him the breath of life. That Adam was a, a person who was, who was whole in himself. He was able to relate to himself. And, and he was able, God gave him a spirit to where he could relate to God. He was the ideal person. And in that, it is because Adam had no reason to sin. There was no reason for Adam to sin. He was the ideal person. He put him in the ideal place. He put him in the garden. It was a beautiful, wonderful, everything that he needed. And he could participate in everything except one tree, the knowledge of good and evil. And now then we find today that God gives him the ideal partner. There was no reason for Adam to sin. And yet Adam sinned. And for every one of us, we can't blame God. We can't blame anything else. We have to take that accountability that we are sinners and we are caught in a broken world. Adam had the ideal partner and we're going to look at her. First of all, God planned a wife for Adam. Look back in verse 18 again. Then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. Now, six times in chapter one, we've read that it was good. God created and it was good. That was the evaluation of everything that God created. It was good. Six times it was good. And then in the completion of that, God said it is very good. But now we come and God says it is not good for man to be alone. And whenever he says it's not good, it's not talking about a moral decision in that sense of not being good. It means that it's not good that he is not complete in what I intend for him. It is not good for Adam to be alone. And so God created Eve. And if you think about why God created Eve, first of all, he created her for companionship. Um, it said it's not good for Adam, for the man to be alone. He needed some companionship. That's why he was created. And, and, uh, and there are times that people, loneliness is something, not because that you're not with people. You, you not only can be with people and be lonely, because it's not just a state of the crowd around you. Matter of fact, in our day and time, uh, I didn't look, but you could come into a crowd just like this crowd, just like a, a group of people, and everybody can be in their own little world because you carry a computer in your hand and that you're concerned about, I mean, we all do it. We're all, if you're sitting in a doctor's office or whatever it may be, and you're waiting and you're just sitting there, so you pull out your phone and you can look at the news. You can see what's going on around the world. You can look and see what somebody is saying ugly about somebody else on one of the social medias, and you can even comment to them, yeah, I agree with that. You, you can just be involved with everybody else except you're in a crowd and you're all alone. Now, I want to say that God doesn't mean for us to experience that kind of loneliness where we are all alone. He said about Adam, it's not good. And I know whenever we talk about the topics of uh, husbands and wives and uh, companionship, um, that is certainly wanting to investigate about Adam and Eve and what God intends for the family. But I know also, whenever I talk about that, that there are people who sit in this congregation this morning and your heart and your mind goes to a place of loneliness because your husband or your wife has already passed and they've already gone to heaven. And there is just that sense. And so I want to say today, I acknowledge that. I, I understand that. But you don't have to be lonely. You'll never be alone. I, I know that there are people here right now today that there's a state, not only maybe because of death, but because of divorce and because situations have changed. And there's a hurt that comes with that. I, I acknowledge that. And I'm sorry for that. I, I know that there's a, a true sense of sorrow that goes with that. But I'm here to tell you, you don't have to be alone. In those most difficult times, God has given a promise that you need to cling to where he says, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. You find that, that fullness in God. Now, as you come to thinking about even for 
for Adam. He, he came to that place where God said it's not good for him to be alone. And he had fellowship with God. But God made a mate for him that was, that was just right for him. He, he made Eve so that there would be an attraction there. There could be a companionship. I recognize that for a lot of people, matter of fact, maybe for all people, as you come to that place where you're attracted to someone else, most of the time that it is, uh, it is a physical attraction. There's nothing wrong with that if you, if you, unless you make it wrong. Um, but I'm here to tell you that there are, there are all American athletes and there are beauty queens that don't necessarily make for a good husband or a good wife. Don't, don't let that be what only attracts you to somebody. Um, my family picked at me because, uh, you know, kids say funny things and they don't really know even what they're, really what they're saying. But we were at a, uh, at a, at a, actually a homecoming. It was kind of like a picnic, dinner on the ground outside. And it was at my grandpa's church. And there was a girl there that was a good bit older than me, probably 10 years older than me. And I was just enamored with her. She was, uh, she was beautiful. And my daddy saw me, I probably was I had this with my mouth open, maybe even drooling or something. And Daddy looked at me and said, Son, you know, they say beauty's only skin deep. And I said, Well, I sure wish I could skin her and take her home. And my family picked at me about that. And then my grandpa looked at me and said, uh, he, he apparently knew her. And he said, Son, and he said, uh, She's fast. That wasn't a good thing. But I looked at him and said, I bet I could beat her in the race. <laughs> I didn't have a clue what I was talking about. And a lot of times people only see beauty is only skin deep. And you, you, you may be attracted because of some uh, physical attraction, but that is not the reason to get married. That is not the reason to get into a, into a relationship with someone. And, and to date someone, not just the physical attraction that we can have. Samson is the example for us. He was attracted and only married because of the physical attraction. He wanted that marriage reign because she was pretty. Didn't work out real well for Samson, did it? And he is that example for us. I remember sitting in the service in a... We, we had come home, actually it was during a hurricane, and made sure that all the folks, when we were at Gulfport, made sure all of our older folks got above I-10 and that they were in a safe place. My dad was, at, no, my mother was actually having surgery on Monday, so we had already planned, I'd already planned to come home, just brought my family. But because of the hurricane that wound up going over into Mobile, uh, we didn't get away till way into the night, and we got to Amory about 8 o'clock in the morning. And uh, so I, it was Sunday morning, so I decided to go on to church, and so I went with my sister and her family. We went to Meadowood Baptist Church. Brother Lloyd Sweat is a pastor, and so during the service, I don't remember what he was preaching on, but he uh, used the example and he, about marriage, and he looked out and he said, Brother Dale, you, you, you've done many, many, many uh, weddings. Have you ever seen a, an ugly bride? And... I hadn't slept in a while, so I said, no, sir, but I've seen some who just barely made it. <laughs> Whenever you come to companionship, it's not just the physical. It is that God has brought you to completion in that relationship, and God has a plan. He planned Eve for Adam. He was suitable. It was, it was that God was going to give him something that was deeper and more complete than he had ever experienced, or could he without her? Now saying this as well, not only, not only does it deal with loneliness of those who have, who have their spouse who's gone to heaven or because of divorce, but also the New Testament tells us, Paul says, I wish everybody could be like I am and be single. There are some people that God just simply ordains and that he, his will for your life is to be single. Don't don't rush into a relationship with a frenzy that you've got to find a husband or a wife. You need to do it the way God recommends, what, the way Adam did it. He waited on the Lord and God brought him Eve. God had it planned. You need to seek God's will and find it 
peace in God's will. But I know that that strikes a tone of loneliness and maybe questioning, but I do believe that God gives us grace in those kind of times. You wait for the person God gives you. And if God's intention is for you to be single, it's because God has a witness through your life that that's the way he can best be glorified. Some things I just don't understand, but I do believe and trust God is a good God. If you, if you think about how God has someone, don't, don't rush into a marriage, don't let it be upon uh, or into a relationship, even, even dating, of someone that is not compatible. She was suitable for him. He said, I'm going to make her. There has to be a cooperation, not only companionship, but cooperation. She's going to be a, uh, a helper. And the, and, the, and the word there is real, literally a help meet. Uh, it is for, for her to be able to be a completer, that she complements what God calls Adam to. I know sometimes... The uh, women's liberation movement just gets furious over these kind of things, and so I may make some people mad. But if you will notice the things that, that are found in Genesis 1 through 11, then you will find that, um, that it is contrary to what the world makes sense of now. That does not make sense to us. It doesn't make sense in the Word of God. And there are things that people uh, get upset about and about submission and about uh, what should happen in a wedding. So what should happen in a marriage? Um, so I want us to think about it today, that there is a sacrifice that you are entering into. There is a cooperation with the plan of God. God has a plan. And for us to find where God has suited us into that plan, what role God has called us to in that plan, there are sacrifices to be made. Where's Brother Mike Simmons? You awake? Can I use your joke? Can I use your joke? All right, Brother Mike had somebody that uh, sent him something and, and uh, said, uh, sent out a, a text that said, um, over a year ago, I bought two tickets, box seats, uh, to the Super Bowl. I paid $2,500 for each seat. But then I didn't realize that it's on the same day as my wedding. And so I need someone to step up for me. It'll be at First Baptist Church. <laughs> She'll be the girl in white. Sometimes we need to make a sacrifice, not in that way, but when we enter into a marriage, because we want God's will to be done. And if you listen to vows at a wedding, that we are saying that we are committed to God's plan for our marriage. Because you have to consider that before you ever get married. You have to consider that. And I'm telling you, young people, you should never date somebody that you couldn't marry. And the Bible says, 2 Corinthians 6 talks about uh, that we shouldn't be unequally yoked. Uh, you should not date anybody that's not saved, that you don't know about their faith. You shouldn't even go out with them because I've done extensive research. I know after years of study, you wind up marrying somebody that you've dated. <laughs> so you need to be careful who you date because a lost person cannot love the way that a believer can. I'm not saying that lost people don't love. I'm saying there, there are four Greek words for love that we, we translate all of them love. And we kind of use it like, oh, I love chocolate ice cream. Oh, I love vanilla ice cream. Oh, I love ice cream. But I also say I love my wife. Now, do I love, I say I love, when I had a dog, I said I love my dog. Does that mean that I love my dog and ice cream the same way that I love my wife? No, it better not mean that, huh? There are four Greek words. It's uh, eros, about a, a physical attraction. Uh, we get the word erotic from that. There's a physical contact of that. Then there is philio, that's a brotherly love, that's a friendship love. There is storge, that is a family love, like you love your mama and you love your brothers and sisters, or eventually you'll love your brothers or sisters. And, and then there is 
a different kind of love, and that is agape love. That is a godly love. That is a selfless love. That is a sacrificing love. And only God can give you agape love. And people love uh, Eros, and they love Philio, and they love Storge. They have a love for their family, but they can't love like a Christian. Because God has placed a different capacity in our heart. And so that's why he tells us not to, uh, just by physical attraction, uh, but because we know that God has selected that person for us. And as you're in the search for that, don't be in a frenzy. You don't have to have a date every Friday night. You, you don't have to go out with everybody. You come to a time where you are faithful to look into somebody's life and see the fruit of their life, how they behave, how they treat other people, and then you hear their testimony. You know that they're saved, and maybe God will allow you to go out and have a good time, and you may date and all such as that, but you maintain your witness during that time, and you pray for God to bring the person you're supposed to marry. Let God be the one to bring him or her. Um, and then it becomes kind of like, uh, kind of like a record, or what we used to buy were records. And, and I'd hear a song, oh, I, li I love James Taylor. And so one of his songs, I, it was a favorite song. So I bought the record and I, that song was on the record. But after I got the record and I, I learned that song and I learned how to play that song. And then I fell in love with that, all the other songs. And I learned to play all those other songs. And that's what marriage ought to be. That God is the one who brings us together. And then we find out the fullness of the blessing. That's what God prepared for Adam. Uh, now, now, as God said, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to create for Adam a helpmate that's suitable for him. And then look what happens in verse 19. After God says that, out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And, and, and he, he named them all. Okay, did Adam know that God was going to bring to him his mate, the one that was going to complete him? Why in the world the next thing did God march all these animals in front of him? Don't you think Adam may have said, ooh, maybe when the hippopotamus came by and he said, ooh, that's a hippopotamus. Uh, surely that's not going to be my helpmate. That's not who God's bringing to me. It marched all the animals. Why, did, why, did, why was that the next thing? It is because God was building and giving Adam the desire for his helpmate, for Eve. God marched all these animals for Adam to look ahead and have a desire for the one that God was going to bring. It, it, it grows within him. And that's what we need to wait on, for God to move within our heart and for us not, not to let everything else that comes in front of us to distract us, but it, that we want God's will in this part of our life. And so that's what happens. And he called her. Whenever he created Eve, um, None of those were right, so he caused a deep sleep to come over Adam, and he removed one of Adam's ribs. Now, gentlemen, I'll tell you which rib that was. That was the rib where we were supposed to know exactly what our wife is thinking. We don't have that anymore. So he took, I'm just kidding. He took that rib out of Adam, and he formed Eve, and out of, out of man. So whenever he saw Eve, what was the first thing he said? Whoa, man. He named her woman. That means out of man. And so what, what happens here is that Eve has to come to the place, and this is a lesson from the principle. For Eve, for a wife, there needs to be a dependency upon her husband. Now this drives the women liberation movement crazy, but this is what God established. First Corinthians talks about this. It's not a matter of equality. It's a matter of the role that God has created her to fulfill. This is her purpose. This is why she's here. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, it says, But I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man, and the man is the head of a woman, and God is the head of Christ. 
And this drives people crazy because they want to interpret it to say that a woman is not equal with a man or that God doesn't value a woman like he values a man or that a woman is less than a man and that they demand for the woman to be treated equal and to be on the same as a man. As far as I'm concerned, that's you're taking a demotion if, you, if that's what you want. That's not... It's not inequality any more than this. Well, let me read, let me read verses, uh, 1 Corinthians 11 verse 8. For man does not originate from woman, but woman from man. For indeed, man was not created for the woman's sake, but woman for the man's sake. That's what he's talking about in the book of Genesis. Verse 11. However, in the Lord, neither is woman independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. Whenever you stop and you think about submission as it talks about it, it is not something that somebody lords over. Matter of fact, Jesus told his disciples, in this world, uh, there are those who lord over those who are, who are given to them, who are uh, in, in uh, over authority over them. But among you, it shall be quite different. If anyone wants to be a leader among you, then you must be a servant. What Jesus is telling us is that it is not where we take advantage to be a higher authority. We are equal. There is an equality within a husband and a wife between a man and a woman. It's not that God created. But women's liberation movement, this is their basic premise, that the differences between men and women are not biological, that they are caused by culture and socialization in a male-dominated society, and they need to be eliminated. Now we're starting, uh, they're talking out of both sides of their mouth they're, they're, because there's a demand that women and men, there's no difference and, and that, that, that in the role of husbands and wives that, that that's archaic and that that's, uh, that that's silly. But we're starting to see that there is a difference because now then, in all the craziness where we say, oh, you can identify with whatever you want to identify and that we can't even determine a pronoun for somebody. And then now then men are starting to say, okay, I identify as a woman and so I'm going to swim with the women or I'm going to play uh, ball with the women and going out and you come to the point to deny that there is a difference. There is a difference in basal metabolism. You take a husband and wife, maybe they're both wanting to lose a little weight, and so they go on a diet together, and then the women fuss at the men because they're doing the same thing, they're eating the same thing, they're walking together at the same time, the same amount, they're doing the same thing, and the man will lose weight, and the, wo and the woman has trouble for losing that weight. First 10 pounds, easy for a man. You know why? Because of our metabolism. We're different. Our bone size, different. Our lung capacity, different. We have more white blood cells. We're different. God created us not, not just because of the, uh, of the reproductive organs. That, that's not it only. God created us different. We are just different. Is a man better than a woman? No. He might could beat her swimming. He might could beat her in something physical. He might not. <laughs> but God made us different. The only place where the world doesn't want us to talk about that is whenever you come to the place about abortion. That this is a woman's body and this is a woman's choice. But everything else, we're all the same. We want to be treated the same. Well, we ought to treat each other the same when you're talking about kindness and love and compassion and, and manners and those sorts of things. But Matthew Henry is the one wise old man that talks about that this difference denotes a dignity. Um, he said, Eve was taken from the side of Adam, not from his head to rule over him, nor from his feet to be trampled under by him, but from his side to be equal to him, under his arm to be protected by him, near to his heart to be loved by him. And so God created and we are equal. But there are roles that we are called by God to live and that's the structure he's established the husband is supposed to be the spiritual leader in his home he is called by God to give direction into his home 
Not, not that the wife doesn't have a say in that and part of that and come to that decision, but God has pl placed the responsibility for that upon the husband. And that's where our problem is in our world today. I, I don't have much doubt that a woman can do the job of a man, that a woman can step up and carry out the task of a man. I've seen that thousands of times. But where I have a doubt is that men will be determined to be the spiritual leader in their family and where men will take the lead over the matters uh, concerning their spirit of the family and give an example to the family. It does not mean that they're not equal. It just simply means that they are, that they are fulfilling the role that God has called them to. If you have any doubt, let me read to you Philippians chapter 2. And uh, beginning in verse 5, I have this memorized from the King James, but I want to read it in New American Standard. Uh, let this attitude, let this heart, let this mind be in you. Have the attitude in yourselves, which also is in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by being obedient to the point of death. Would you say that Jesus is less than God the Father? No. Would you say that Jesus is anything other than God? No. He was completely man, but he was completely God. But what did Jesus say? He said, my will is to do the will of the Father. My bread is to, is to do the will of God, my Father. I'm sitting here to please the Father. And so there was a role that Jesus was assigned to, and that is as our Redeemer. But that did not diminish his equality. He just didn't demand the rights of it. It is the same picture for Christ and the church, the same picture for a husband and for a wife. And God has called men to be the spiritual leader, and God has called the wife to also be able to be, not, not just to depend upon the husband to fulfill his role, but also to fulfill her role to help complete that and help make that possible. Because if, if the wife doesn't do her part, the husband will fail. And whenever we forget this, you will always see trouble in the home. So the wife is now presented to Adam, verse 22, the Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. And uh, down in verse 24, he says, For this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother, be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. God presented, and so in the King James it says that he is to cleave to her. There is this principle to leave and to cleave. God, God brings Adam and Eve together. God brings a husband and wife together. And then because of that, that relationship becomes primary. I'm just going to mention this in passing, but this is the place to mention it. Whenever God says to them, and it comes out that a man, whenever God brings a man and a woman together, husband and wife together, that they are, he is to, he is to cleave and to leave. Leave his father and mother. I'm not talking about grandparents. I'm not talking about the father and the mother. I'm talking about for the husband and wife. That they need to come to that place that they stand on their own. They are now a family. They need to make new things. They're going to make new babies. They're going to make a new family. But they need to make new traditions. It doesn't mean that they have to turn the apple cart over and offend everybody. It just simply means that they come to a point to make decisions that are best for their family. So those, that new husband and new wife, they need to cut the apron string. They need to cut the purse string. They need to stand on their own feet. As grandparents and grown parents and grown children, we want to help, and we can help. There are times to help, but we want them to succeed. And where that does not happen, there will always be, always be a problem. It'll always linger. And so that's why God gives this principle of separation. That doesn't mean that... Um, my mom and daddy are in heaven, but after I got married, I was no longer their child. I wasn't their child anymore. You know why? Because I wasn't a child. 
I was an adult. I got married. I had my own family. That didn't change that I was their son. It didn't change that I honored my father and mother. I gave weight to what they said, but that my wife and I made the decisions for our family. I, I remember the time that uh, uh, Joshua was little. He had done something that, that was probably horrible, terrible. He probably had, I don't know, robbed the bank. I, I don't know what he did. I don't remember that. But because of that, I carried him, whatever was going on, and I carried him into the, uh, the room, and I got out the spanking spoon, and he got a spanking. And, oh, he cried. I'm sure he cried. And then, standing in the doorway, was this sweet woman who had raised me, but her eyes had turned red, and fangs grew out of her mouth, and there were claws in her hand, and she came to, def she came to defend her. And I said, Mama, this is my son, and he did this wrong. And we're teaching him. We're disciplining him. I didn't, I didn't whip him. I disciplined him. And my mama said, you're right. And she never, she never interfered again. I think for every family, we come to that place where that tension grows. But you come back to this principle. We're to leave and to cleave and we're to love. And in that, parents and grandparents want to see our children succeed. And then there is the principle of submission. The husband and wife relationship is to be a permanent relationship. And we stand at the altar and we say, until death alone shall we part. And we are supposed to be able to live a life together, finding the role that God calls us to do together. And we are a team. And as we work together, and Leanne and I, Leanne, we confess to this, that we've had to pull aside at times when our kids, because you know what kids do. Kids come and they ask mama, can I do this? Or, or first of all, they go to daddy and they say, can I, can I do this? And daddy gives the answer, what do all daddies say? No matter what the request is. No. They say, no, you can't do that. Then they say, go ask your mom. But if a daddy says no, and then they go to mama, and mama says yes. There's a disagreement there. And the child pits daddy against mama, and mama against daddy, and the child comes out the winner? No, they do not. Whenever they see mom and daddy on two different sides, then we are damaging that child's perspective on what marriage is supposed to be. Husband and wives have to be on the same page. So there are times whenever we have to pull aside and say, hey, look, they ask about this. You know they're playing this, don't you? You know that's what every child does. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. We have to be on the same page. Your children never need to see you arguing about that. You don't need to, um, you don't need to damage that testimony for your child. They need to see... The best gift that a daddy can give to a child is that they love their mama. The best gift that a mother can give to their child is that mom and daddy love each other and that they are together and that they are working together and that the child's not going to tear them apart. But so often, they tug on our heartstrings and it causes us to do more or less Disobedient. And you know what it all boils down to? The authority that we don't want to submit to God and to each other. And it is mutual submission. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 21 says to submit to one another. It is a mutual submission. And the reason for that is for our home to be complete. There is the principle of submission, but also of, of separation, the principle of submission. That's not just a, um, a sexual oneness. It's not just the joining of the flesh, but it is a spiritual submission that we come together. My heart is burdened. I've been in the ministry a long time. I've seen folks, I've seen churches throughout our state. I've watched our culture come to a time 
where there's not a oneness in homes because sometimes there's only one in the home. Families are torn apart. And the whole reason for that is because of authority. We will not submit to authority. And that's not the wife submitting to the husband or the husband submitting to the wife. It is that they will not submit to the authority of God over their home. Every marriage that I perform, I require premarital counseling for us to sit down. And the things that we talk about is, first of all, uh, about their relationship. Are they equally yoked? There's only been uh, three weddings that I could not perform because one mate, one, one person was lost and the other was a Christian, a believer. And uh, they weren't happy about that. But there are two occasions where I sit down and the, the husband in those cases was a believer, the, the wife-to-be was not. And so it gave me an opportunity to just present the gospel. And in those two cases, the wife got saved. And I got to baptize them, and then I got to do their wedding. Uh, those are special to me. But after you see that, I talk about communication because we all communicate differently and they need to learn how to communicate. And then I talk about um, their, their oneness, about them coming together as husband and wife and, uh, and for them to be able to discuss financial matters. Uh, financial matters are a great source of, of stress and why a lot of divorces take place because you, you have usually a spender and a saver and you've got to come to the place where you communicate that and you talk about that and you're together on that. And then the third is about their, their sin and their past life or anything. If anything that's happened in the past could come up and damage their testimony now, then they need to talk about that. It doesn't mean they have to hang all their dirty laundry out, but if it affects their lives now, they need to ask for forgiveness. They need to deal with that and get that right. And if a, if a family will do that, then it will be like Adam and Eve, where they come into the garden and they are not ashamed. I believe that God has a plan, and I believe Satan is doing everything he can. And the way he has chosen to attack it is, is not just not just the physical part of it, but is the mindset to where a daddy does not take the authority and spiritual responsibility in their homes. And because of that, that many homes suffer. They stay together. And after the children are gone, they look across the table and not only do they question the love for one another, they don't even like one another. That's not the way God planned it. Not for Adam and not for you. Here's the invitation today. If you're here and you're married already, God had a plan for you and he prepared your wife or your husband for you. They are unique. They are prepared by God and they are their own person. But God means you to come together as husband and wife. If you are not playing the role that God has placed you in, you need to confess that before the Lord as sin. You need to ask for forgiveness, and then you need to renew your mind. Romans 12, 1 and 2, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto the Lord, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed, how? by the renewing of your mind, that you may know and prove the perfect and acceptable will of God. You need to have a renewed mind. This is what God established. This is what I'm going to do. You need to ask for God's grace and for you to be able to do the role that God's called you to. And you need to communicate that in your family. If you are a single mom or a single dad, then you need to rest in the Lord. Somebody else may come into your life, but you need to wait till God brings them, and you don't need to worry about searching for them. God will bring them, if that's supposed to be. And if it's not, you're never going to be alone. You always, always have the promise that God said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. 
The other invitation is here today. If God loves so much us that he would plan out life for us to bless us in every relationship and you have never trusted him, then today the Bible says that you and I are sinners. We all sin and come short of the glory of God. Because of that, we're separated from him. But the Bible says that God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, that Christ died for us. And if we will confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God was raised from the dead, then we shall be saved. And you can get on the path of a plan that God has for your life that will culminate and end in completion in heaven. In this broken state right now, God is the only one who can bring healing. And he will take all those former things and he'll make all things new. But it calls for faith. You have to believe. Let's pray.